Okay, name is Robert Neil McEldowney. I was born March 15, 1935, in Cory, Pennsylvania, and I joined the Army in uh, 1952 in the spring when I turned 17 years old. And my name is Teresa, and next to me is Megan McEldowney, and he is Megan McEldowney's grandfather. This interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so we'll start with where you were born and your childhood. Born what? Where you were born, your childhood, and how was your childhood? Uh, I lived in Cory. Pretty much, we were uh, we were a uh, just a regular family. Nothing outstanding or anything. Uh, struggling financially like everybody else was during that time. Things were kind of tough. My mother died. Oh boy, when did she die? Help me out. <laughs> you, want me to ask? you don't remember my mother? No, I don't. I can't ask. Uh, she died when I was uh, eight years old, nine years old. My dad died when I was 13 years old. Mm -hmm. So when they, when mama died, uh, I was, my dad remarried, but that didn't work out so good. So they put up, my brother, my little brother and I were placed in a orphanage in Erie, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And I was in the orphanage till I was 14 years old. And I ran away and went back to Cory and lived with my brother for a couple of years. I worked in a, a steel mill. We built uh, propeller shafts for Navy ships yeah. until I was uh, 17. And then I joined the Army. You know, hope I hope to... Uh, have a, some kind of career, learn a trade or something in the army that I could use when I got out. But they put me in blacksmith school. <laughs> I couldn't really use that for anything. A blacksmith in Korea, you had a truck, a K-43 truck they call it, and it had a forge in there and an anvil and pieces of steel and all kinds of tools a blacksmith would use, and then if a part broke down, like on one of those big guns, those big cannons, if a firing pin, you know, about like that, if a firing pin broke, then they could tell me and I could cut it and I could uh, make a, a rough, and then there was another truck there called a K-44 truck, that was a machinist truck. And then I'd give the little rough piece of steel to him, and then he would finish it on the lathe. And then, you know, and then they could put it in the gun. You couldn't go to the store and buy parts over there for cannons. Okay. And then they disbanded our outfit there, and I was sent to uh, the southern, most southern island in uh, Japan. I think it was called... Fukuoka, Fukuoka, the main island was Kyushu and then Hokkaido was up there. But mostly when, when I was in the army, uh, being attached to the Air Force, I, I didn't really get involved in the Air Force that much. We had a job to do for them. And so I spent a lot of time in headquarters company. And most of the time I was a driver. I drove officers to Tokyo or wherever, here and there, meetings or whatever. And I drove officers' wives around. And if there were any dignitaries, senator or somebody that came to visit, I'd, I could uh, show, show for them, those guys around. Then I was discharged in 55 in... Uh, 
California, Marysville, California. So I took a bus, a Greyhound bus. I wanted to, had a, they gave me a hundred dollars. And that, that was big money. So I took a bus and went down to, La I wanted to see the country. So I bus down to Los Angeles and across the bottom of the country, Texas and all that, and ended up in Georgia. My sister, uh, her and her husband, were going to a Bible college there, Tacoa Falls Bible, well, it was Tacoa Falls Institute, but it trained missionaries and preachers and teachers and nurses. So I went there, uh, 55, uh, got saved there, became a Christian there, got got graduated in 59, but I was not accepted because of my ears and my monotone voice. I, I did my uh, paperwork and all of the seminar and all of that on uh, Cambodia, but I couldn't do that. You know, their language is <laughs> like that. And I, my ears and my mouth wouldn't, voice wouldn't pass. So I had to get a job. We had John, our oldest boy at that time, and uh, got a job in retail at F.W. Woolworth Company, dime store, and uh, worked there for 24 years. And uh, had managed stores all throughout the Midwest. And then they went out of business, and then I went right over at the same time to Walmart. Walmart was just getting started then. And I worked my way up there, assistant manager, manager, and then district manager. I had several stores I was responsible for in South Texas, Houston and down. And then, uh, what was after that? Uh, I re took an early retirement and I went to work in real estate uh, here at Grand Rapids. The reason we ended up here is because uh, all our kids graduated from high school when we were moving around, had all those stores. Well, they had, most of them graduated when we was in this area. So we came back here to be with the kids and the grandkids in church. And, and then uh, I worked real estate, Westdale and Green Ridge for four years. And then uh, a buddy at church said uh, he had a perfect job for us, uh, driving for FedEx. We had to buy a van, a cargo van and lease it to FedEx for what they call critical, custom critical. And we, we took all kinds of critical things uh, all over the place. And we did that for 19 years until February of this year. And I couldn't pass my physical, couldn't pass the DOT physical, hazmat and all that. So uh, now I'm, we're working, I'm working as a security guard. Uh, here with FedEx oh. that, and that's just a rough thumbnail sketch of, of our lives. We've been Mar Mary and I, Mom, we've been married uh, 60 years and uh, five kids, four of them normal, and 11 grandkids. No, no grandkids, no great grandkids. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, well, we, we've always been active in church until the driving job, and we weren't home on the weekends. So, some weekends we were home, but some we weren't. And that's roughly our lives. Okay, that's really good. Um, I have a few questions. Yep. Yeah. Um, you said that you received six medals. Yeah. Do you remember what each of them were? Yeah, I remember the easy ones. Good conduct. <laughs> uh, Korean theater. United Nations something. A meritorious unit commendation. 
that it was a laurel wreath, a gold laurel wreath on a green background looked just like a toilet seat. So that's what we called it. We won a toilet seat and they go on your uniform down here. Oh. That when they broke up our outfit in Japan, the, the president came uh, and they had a big parade for us at an Air Force base in Tachikawa, Japan, uh, the headquarters. And they had a parade for us and gave us a commendation and booted us out. And a lot, a lot of the times, I, I uh, was on what they call TDY, Tour of Duty Yonder. TDY is the Army designation. And I played uh, softball and basketball and football. And I even built a miniature golf course for one of the one of the companies. Yeah. So he played baseball, right? <laughs> yeah. So I heard you played baseball too. Do you think you were really good at baseball and all it, that? Kinda. Yeah. I made the All Far East Military All Star Team at a at mm -hmm. a tournament. That's yeah. Good. And then also I played baseball and basketball in college. Yeah. Um. There's one other question. Um, can you tell me about Scar Wolf again? Special category, Army reassigned with Air Force, Scar Wolf. Uh, we didn't have, United States didn't have a Air Force. It used to be called Army Air Corps, and Army guys flew the planes. It, but then, 1948, the commis president commissioned a, uh, the United States Air Force in Colorado Springs and University and all of that. And uh, so, <clears throat> we they took several company, couple companies from the Army and lent them to the Air Force. To How many siblings did you have, and were you like oldest or middle, or where were you? In my family, yes, in your family. Uh, there were six of us in our family, uh, mm -hmm. two girls and four boys, and I was the next to the youngest boy. Oh. And I'm the only one left, by the way. Wow. They're all gone. Did you get everything worked out with your parents, right? Huh? Your grandma said your mom died first yeah. at six. And then your dad, yeah, at nine, and then your stepmom, right? Yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mentioned that a little bit. Gotcha. That that marriage, their marriage didn't work out so good. <laughs> she, uh, she, uh, Daddy should have known that before he married her, but she hated kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she was an old maid. I don't know, forty. 50 years old or something, an old maid that worked in a steel mill in the same place Daddy worked, but she didn't care for kids, so it was either her or us that had to go, mm -hmm. and it was my little brother and I that went. Okay. Um, were there anything that stood out during your times of service that was like unique or special? No, it's kind of just routine, just military routine. Uh, we got paid uh, $50 a month extra uh, for being in Japan if, on the condition that we spend it in town. That was right after we dropped a bomb there and wiped out Hiroshima and Nagasaki and them, the atom bomb. And so that, that was interesting. And we could check out jeeps out of the motor pool and just take off and explore Japan. That, that was interesting. Did you meet anyone that stood out to you? Like, yeah. did you connect with anyone connect personally? With like, did you have a really close friend that you met? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I had a couple of them. Both of them got killed. <laughs> Bobby O'Connor got shot in Korea. Mm -hmm. And, uh, can't think of his name. He's a black, black guy from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We were buddies. He got a call one afternoon, or the company got a call, 
Uh, what's his name? I don't know. <laughs> I didn't think I'd ever forget his name. Anyway, they called a company and said, we need a replacement right now. So they picked him, sent him over there this afternoon. The next afternoon, we got a message. He got, he got shot. He got killed when he first got there. Um, he left me. Just in case anything happened, he left me all his stuff clothing and whatever, and asked me to send, if anything happened to him, to send it home to his mom. Oh. Um, were there any other of your family members who served in the military? Yeah. Older brother, uh, December, what was it, 10th, 1942, they bombed Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. and we had a radio, you had to go, it's a car battery. You had to go gas station and get your battery charged up, bring it back and hook up the clamps, and you could listen to a radio off of that battery. And a Sunday morning, we was listening to the radio, and that whoever, Kilton Bourne or some, one of those newsmen then, uh, said uh, Japan has declared war on the United States. And my brother joined the Navy right, right then when that happened. Oh. Okay, um, how was your time of service affected your life? So like, was it a major effect or did it affect a little? Good and bad. Mm -hmm. uh, got some bad habits. Everybody in our outfit drank a lot. And if you didn't, you know, you're stuck in the mud. So that, that wasn't good. But I quit when I got out, so I hadn't drank any since. A couple little things like that, but mostly it was a learning experience. and met a lot of different people. In fact, they wrote a book about our outfit, Ichiban. Did you hear about that? No. Sis bought it for me. Sis found the book. <laughs> and bought it for me, Ichiban. <laughs> and that was a book about our outfit. A guy named Ernie Spires, he's a doc, medical doctor, mm -hmm. was in our outfit, one of the guys in the outfit. And he kept a diary of all his time in, our, in the company when we was there. Ichiban, I'll, I should have brought that. That would tell you a lot better than I could mm -hmm. what we did. I'll show you next time you're over. Ichiban means number one. Ichi ni san chi go hiroku uchi hachiku ju. One to ten. Ichiban number one, or one number, backwards. Um, so this means, were you in Japan for a long time then? One year, eleven months, yeah. and one day. So did you learn a lot of Japanese or? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a... Uh, we lived in Quonset huts, mm -hmm. and they like pallets, a wooden, big wooden pallet, and a, and a wood, about a four foot wood wall around the pallet, and then a tent, a big old tent, and eight of us slept in each tent, called them Quonset huts. And uh, we had, they encouraged us to hire somebody from town to wash our clothes or iron or make our beds, shine our shoes. And the guy, and I don't know the guy's name, I still don't remember. The little old Japanese guy, nicest man in the world. Papasan is all we knew. We call him Papasan. And uh, he was working to buy his daughter back. He, they were coal miners somewhere. And uh, he got in debt to the company, the coal mining company, and they took his daughter. He had to give his daughter to settle his debt. So he was work, we paid him, we paid him really good and more than good to help him buy his daughter back. And uh, last question. Yep. Okay. It says, do you have any advice or anything important that you learned just in life in general? Uh, 
oh, many, 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 many things, but you might, I don't know, tell, them, tell her what I've learned. You know me. I don't know. What have I learned? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. The most important thing in my life was becoming a Christian. Yeah. That's yeah. Ichiban. Uh, and then j just everything that goes with that. Be, be perfectly honest. Be honest. Perfectly honest. Doesn't matter. They call it honest to a fault. Even if it hurts you or costs you something. Be honest. And uh, people... I, got, I, I seem to have a knack for people. I don't, I don't think I've ever, for very long, disliked anybody. I don't have any enemies, I don't think. And uh, I, I just enjoy people. That's good. And we, Mom and I have had a rough life, tough time, having one right now. we are retired and I don't know how much longer it can work. Uh, so that's going to be tough, but life's been interesting. A lot of challenges, but you just keep going. Uh, oh, it, one thing I learned, it told all the kids, I don't know I ever told you, uh, you don't lose a boxer, doesn't lose a fight for getting knocked down. He only loses if he doesn't get up. Yeah, that's kind of stuck with me all through life. You know, just keep going, keep your head up, and hope, keep going, but do it right. Yeah. Yeah. What else? You know me. What have I learned? Um, what have you learned from me? Grandkids. Huh? Kids. My mom and dad toss right. That's what I learned too. They do what? They taught us right. Yeah. Yeah, from, yeah. From the Bible. Yeah. yeah. Our, our parents back then, 30, I was born 35, and uh, the mom and daddy, neither one had an education. Uh, I don't know how long mama went to school. I guess grade school maybe. They were farmers. That's mm -hmm. all they did, farm. It, it was a, what they call agricultural industry back at that time, before the industrial age and now the service age. But uh, parents weren't equipped to raise their kids very good back then. Didn't have all the tools or books or knowledge or James Dobson wasn't born yet and all of that. You know, now you got parents have uh, several resources to raise their kids right. Yeah. But so you can't hold it against people our age. Can't hold it against your parents if they weren't very sharp. Yeah. They were good workers and honest people. You did learn that, mm -hmm. and you learned a good work ethic. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything else you would like to say? I know you're Betty, or going down to Grandma, or did you go up? Do what? Didn't you hitchhike to Pennsylvania for Grandma once? <laughs> yeah. That and then, and you always talk about Betty, your sister. So. Yeah, oh Betty, she's, she's my older sister. She just died three, four years ago maybe. She was 89. And uh, she's the big, biggest influence on my life. What, uh, the good things I learned in life, I learned from Betty. When Mama died, she was kind of the substitute Mama. Mm -hmm. And then uh, she don't want to hear about Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> we were so in love. We, we, uh, summer vacation from college. Mm -hmm. And I came back to Pennsylvania to stay with my brother. And mom was going to a camp in Indiana. But she had to go to Pennsylvania to pick up a girl called Doris Leach. So Pennsylvania, and I was in Cory up there, I don't know, maybe 50, 60 miles. So I hitchhiked down there and surprised her to visit her. Uh, that was, that not anything to... 
We it's romantic. Hit, we hitchhiked everywhere we went back then. <laughs> uh -huh. My dad never owned a car until right before he died. Oh. He had a Western Flyer bicycle with a basket on it. Wow. So then who, who got the car after he passed away? I don't know. You don't know? Okay. <laughs> just, just... I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, I think that's the end of it. Um, thank you for doing this interview for me. Yeah, that was fun. Okay, yeah, it was. It was really interesting to hear your life. It was really fun, too. And, um, I think that's it.